So I've been teaching a compassion class at the residential PTSD unit at the VA in Menlo Park, California, where veterans have come from all over the country for treatment for their trauma. These guys are amazing. They're so inspiring. They've been to war. They've taken service and commitment to a whole other level. They're suffering themselves from their trauma, but they'll do anything they can to help somebody else out. It's just incredible to be around. They've been delving into the course wholeheartedly. I've asked them to do 20 minutes of guided meditation in the morning, and instead they do the whole 60-minute CD. Guys who aren't, who aren't even in the class have been going to meditation sessions in the morning because they've been hearing that it's helpful for their friends, and they've wanted to check it out. I was first exposed to meditation in ninth grade. I started practicing at that time, and when I got to college, I took the opportunity to study Tibetan Buddhist texts. I spent time in India, Nepal, and Tibet, studying with Tibetan teachers and working in refugee communities. From there, I went on to do years of silent, cloistered meditation retreats. 100-day retreats, six-month retreats, years all together, silent, head-shaved, the whole nine yards. I really wanted to delve in and experience the tradition that I've been reading about and trying to understand from more of an academic perspective. And when I completed this intensive period of training, my teachers encouraged me to take what I had learned into the workplace. That was both a challenge and an opportunity. It was challenging in a, as a new social worker in an inpatient psychiatric unit to keep up in the first place, let alone to try and apply tools that I'd been using in such a different context. But over time, working with teachers, talking to more experienced people, I began to find my footing in this new sort of integrated environment. And people started asking me when they heard that I was interested in meditation. They wanted to learn how to do it. So it's been about 10 years now that I've been teaching meditation to a variety of people, healthcare providers. I've taught activists in interfaith settings, refugees domestically and abroad. I've worked in inpatient psychiatric unit, now with veterans. And I think one of the things that brings people to learn these tools is this desire to connect with the compassion that they already have and that they so value but they lose track of how to access it in daily life. So what they're looking for is something practical, something that they can apply. So I became interested after doing this kind of work and becoming incredibly inspired by the people I was working with, by the passion they were bringing to their careers, and the desire that they had to grow their compassion and their expression of it. So my doctoral dissertation focused on the pedagogy for how we could teach meditation in secular environments. And in a nutshell, what I learned was that there was a need to draw from both the contemplative traditions and their richness and also marry them to what we know of contemporary psychology and learning theory to create transformative learning experiences that apply to us in our lives and our culture as we are. So what I'm gonna talk about today is not new. It comes from long traditions of study and practice. But I'm going to borrow on the languaging from the experience I've had teaching, and more importantly, from the people that I've been working with. So what is this compassion that I'm referring to? What am I talking about here? A working definition that might be useful is compassion as the desire to alleviate suffering. So the awareness of suffering and the desire to lean into it and engage with it and help lessen it. So the premise is that everyone has compassion. Compassion is something we all have available. As we heard from researchers at the University of Chicago last year, even rats demonstrate the capacity for compassion. And they would go out of their way to free another rat, even if it meant that they had to share their chocolate. That's serious. <laughs> but clearly, if we look inward at our own minds, at our own experience, or if we look at the newspaper, we're not all coming from a place of compassion all the time. So on one hand, it's something we have. And on the other hand, 
It's something that we're not always able to draw from, despite our best intentions. So what I'm interested in is how do we grow the compassion? How do we make it something that we can access, draw from throughout our day, in our lives, in our relationships, in the small moments, and then have it for the large ones as well? So what is real compassion? I use the term real here to make the point that it's not some nicey, saccharine thing that we're importing and putting on top of our perspective. And I also mean real here in the sense of it's about us getting real, real with ourselves, about who we actually are, our best intentions, and then the things that go on to make us fall short of them. So I'm a Gen Xer. I'm from New Jersey. I grew up with Beavis and Butthead. I'm not coming from an overly sentimentalized kumbaya kind of mentality. I promise you that. So what I'm interested in here is the actual compassion, the experience of compassion, and what I've learned in trying to practice this stuff and working with people who are interested, teaching compassion classes really means just creating a forum to work together to explore these things in conversation with tools and with our own lives. And so what I've really learned from this process is that a lot of what compassion is about is the opposite of what you think. It's about seeing what gets in the way of our being compassionate about seeing what gets in the way of our drawing from what we intend to in our relationships. And it's not just this depressing project like I might be portraying it as, which I don't mean to be. It's actually really funny. It's the basis for Larry David and Curb Your Enthusiasm when he makes public our private insanity and we see it displayed in front of us and it's hilarious because we recognize ourselves in that. We recognize ourselves in him and all of his shenanigans. So there's incredible, inspiring figures like the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu articulating heartfelt reasons for why we need to grow in our compassion, why we're missing it in our individual lives and in our collective well-being. There's also a growing body of research about the study of compassion, how we can measure it, how it maps onto the brain, how it's impacted by various social situations, and how it translates across cultures. So my topic today isn't going to be to repeat all of this work. It's going to be just to simply talk about how. How do we draw on this compassion that we have, but we can't necessarily access when we want it? And it doesn't just work to tell ourselves, I'm going to be more compassionate now. Here I am. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to be more compassionate going forward. This is a great idea, and I'm, I'm on board. I'm doing it. How many of us have tried to make that kind of a moral commitment? How far does it get you? It can be inspiring for a little while. I don't mean to knock it. But it's not a practical tool that will get us from here to there, as it were. So what I want to suggest are three practical things that we can do to expand our compassion. There are the pause, start in your own kitchen, and use prompts. So first, we have to stop. We're not going to go off to a cave. We're not going to leave our jobs. We're not going to leave our relationships behind the things, our responsibilities, and nor do we necessarily want to. But we do need to do is find ways that we can pause in the midst of our lives, in ways that work for us, that we're actually going to do. So that might not be meditation for you. It might be taking a walk. A friend of mine told me that last week, before she swam her laps that day, she sat with her feet in the pool. And she just sat there for five minutes before getting in to swim. And she said it was the first time since she'd birthed her son a year ago that she had just stopped. She'd sat before, of course, we all sit, but she didn't just stop. There's a difference there, and I think we all know what that is. I don't have to explain that to you. But we do need to make the space for that. Research is showing us that the first 20 minutes of exercise can give us tremendous health benefits. We don't have to run a whole marathon to improve our physical well-being. And in fact, if we're not going to do that 20 minutes, simply standing up at a regular interval can improve our health. So think about that. The same principle applies here for the pause. We don't have to go off for weeks on end. 
We don't have to take hours that we don't have in our day. Could we take 20 minutes? Could we take five? Could we just take a moment? So the second tool is start in your own kitchen. And this has to do with practice. So even if we take pauses, we need to learn to draw from the perspective that we gain in those pauses. And a lot of us come to this kind of conversation from the premise that, well, maybe later. I'm really busy right now, but I'll take all this up later when I can clear a really good space for it in my life. Or the metaphor here would be, when I remodel my kitchen, then I'm going to deal with this. Or actually, when my kitchen gets cleaned up, it's a really big mess right now. When it's cleaned up, then I'll start. That'll be the time to start. And what I want to say is, no, that's not the time to start. The time to start is in your kitchen, in your messy kitchen, as it is now. The boxes of tea falling out of the cabinet, whatever your thing is. Start there in your kitchen. I guess the point I'm really trying to get at is we have this idea that life is in the way of compassion or in the way we're too busy to do our real intentions. But when we just start, when we just start in our own kitchen, what we see is that the life, the messiness, all the things that seem like they were in the way are actually the opportunity. And I want to acknowledge that there is a gap. I don't want to just sweep that under the rug here. There is a gap between our ideal, compassionate selves and the version of ourself that we're intimately familiar with, the darkness, the perversity, all of that kind of stuff. And there is this gap here. And what we normally do is beat up on ourselves about that gap. Earlier this year, I woke up and checked my email in the morning, and I saw an email saying, are you OK? We missed you last night. And it turned out I had missed a guest lecture I was supposed to do. So I was mortified. I wrote an apology, and I tried to get back to my work for the day, doing the writing and the other things I had on the agenda. My mind just kept going back to this thing that I had missed. Not only did my mind go back there, I was beating myself up about it, until I realized, oh my gosh, this is so absurd. The guest lecture, I kid you not, that I was supposed to do was about self-compassion. <laughs> Honestly, swear. And it gets better. The person who was convening the course, the, le the, the professor of the class, is a world expert on forgiveness. <laughs> For real. And I'm here beating myself up over it. It's ridiculous. But the point is, is that's where we are. That's where we are, and that's not a problem. That we need to engage with this gap, engage with the tension between the ideal and the actual, and we need to engage with it with self-compassion, with humor, and support ourselves and support each other in doing that. And self-compassion, I'm going to argue, is the oxygen mask that we need to put on so that we can take care of the people around us in the cabin. We can't skip over it. Yes, service can be an important path towards engaging with self-compassion, but we can't ignore it altogether. It's, it won't work. So the other thing that I want to propose is that when we start looking at this tension between the ideal and the actual, that what we find is that not only are we in this situation, but everybody else is. And that's when the self-compassion becomes authentic or real compassion for other people. It's not this nicey thing that we're sort of slapping on top of everything. It's actually engaging in the, from the perspective that we're all in this together. We're all dealing with the perverseness and the beauty of our own minds and holding the tension between those and living there and doing beautiful things with that tension, with both of those parts of ourselves. And we're all doing that. So what was a wall separating us in our suffering becomes a window into the shared human experience. So the third of the three tools that I want to talk about is the prompt. So the pauses we need to do, we need to find our way with them, the way that we'll actually use. And we need to start in our own kitchen. But even if we do both those things, we need prompts to remind us in the context of our lives, things that will signal us that we've gotten caught in our heads, come back into our bodies, and into the intentions that we've set for ourselves. This, the prompt comes from both contemplative traditions, not just Buddhism. All contemplative traditions have this kind of interface with life. It's not just about drawing back from life. It's about engagement, ultimately. And it's also drawing from the best of behavioral psychology. 
So what I want to suggest is that the pause and the prompt inform and mutually support one another. And what we should do, I don't want to keep this vague, I want to make it specific, that prompts are something that happen in our own life. And maybe we pick a challenging area. One of the veterans that I was working with, he had a lot of domestic problems. He was having a lot of arguments with his wife, a lot of issues going on. So the prompt he picked was when she called him on the cell phone, the cell phone ringing was the prompt for him to pause and reconnect with his intention for how he wanted to engage. So the outer stimulus becomes the prompt for this compassionate embodiment. One of my prompts is when I ask my husband at the end of the workday how his day was, that when I hear the words coming out of my mouth, that reminds me to actually stop and listen to him. It's shocking. It's totally revolutionary. It's changed things. I can't tell you. And I still fail, but it's a prompt. I'm working with it. <laughs> Another prompt we could pick is in when we're waiting in line, and that's a time that we're either agitated or we're trying to distract ourselves. Pick waiting as a prompt then we can be in relationship to the people we're waiting with. It just, we don't have to do anything weird, like try and like get in their face and have a conversation. We can just be privately experiencing relationship with them. And when we're engaging with the person who's giving us our change, we're doing that from a totally different perspective. And that has meaning. It's small, but it has meaning. We could be picking the prompt of the steering wheel, putting our hands on the steering wheel in the car. When we use that prompt intermittently, it reminds us to come back to our intention. So when someone cuts us off, remember I'm from New Jersey, this happens a lot. Um, instead of just getting agitated at that person, we could do different things. We could pause, we could think about, for all I know, maybe they're on their way to help a sick relative. Or maybe they're totally a jerk and they're in their own head and they're endangering my life. But wait a minute, I'm also someone who was just spaced out a few minutes ago and I use prompts to remind me to be present. And for all I know, I just cut somebody else off. We could use a coworker who makes digs at us. The experience of the sting of the dig could be the reminder. These are the kind of practical things that we can use. And what they do is break down this idea that there's important and people I care about, people I ignore, people I can't stand, who are just inherently irritating. And what we're left with without these boxes is just a basic, fundamental humanity that we all share. So in closing, what I want to suggest is that compassion matters. That real compassion is contagious. It impacts our personal experience and it also impacts our relationships. The way I see it, real compassion has enormous transformative potential the power to change the world. Thank you.